when Malik and I were talking about who would be best to moderate this panel, um, Liz, Liz Sevchenko came to mind immediately. She's the director of the Human Humanities Action Lab here at the New School, and she's a practice collaborator. What's, what better description for a moderator? <laughs> I mean, that is the job description. And her work on the history of the US presidents in Guantanamo Bay makes her a de facto expert on places and spaces wounded by politics. So Liz, I now invite you, Yukiko, Alexandra, and Benjamin to share your thoughts on the politics of commemoration. Thank you. And thanks to Susan and Malgo. This is a really extraordinary event, and I'm so happy to be a part of it. I'm very impressed and inspired. I'm also really happy that um, we were invited to follow a discussion of states of exception because, uh, as Susan alluded to, my um, uh, introduction to Agamben was through uh, the US Naval Base at Guantanamo, which is sort of the most uh, literal state of exception, sort of born in the moment of his um, of his use of that term. And I'm also excited uh, to be talking about this with you right now because something's evolved um, in terms of the politics of commemoration there just now um, that I'm hoping to get your thoughts about and hoping to reflect on through my exchanges with my fellow panelists. So I, um, just a couple weeks ago, got a call from a lawyer defending Khalil Sheikh Mohammed. Um, who, as many of you know, is the sort of professed mastermind of the 9-11 attack, so uh, is the sort of most controversial figure um, in uh, who currently being held um, now in his 11th year of imprisonment at the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. And she had just learned that a CIA black site where KSM had been held and tortured before being brought to his the current facility he's at uh, at Gitmo had been decommissioned, uh, which simply means sort of uh, basically means that it's soon to be destroyed. Um, it's a difficult uh, preservation and commemoration question uh, that she was posing to me because I'm not allowed to know where it is. Um, so it could be anywhere in the world. So it's a very abstract. Uh, concept, but she came with um, with some interesting questions that were very unexpected, and I think are really uh, relevant and interesting for all of us. Um, she had already prepared; the whole team had already prepared a whole um, sort of protest, which is not the legal word, but I don't know the legal word um, around the loss of forensic evidence and sort of treating as the loss of the crime scene. So that was sort of not what she was calling me about. Um, instead, she felt she needed to build a larger and a different argument. So she asked if I could provide an argument for what was the moral imperative for preserving this site? What would be lost for humanity if it was destroyed? And ultimately she said, you need, I want you to establish why does place matter? Um, so this was a really big question. I certainly don't have the answers, but I'm happy to, to sort of work through them. Uh, and these papers I think you're gonna find um, will really, uh, are very helpful to me and helpful in looking at those questions. So she found me in particular, um, simply because uh, in 2009, in the sort of heady days after uh, Guantanamo, uh, um, President Obama's executive order uh, to close Guantanamo, I had brought together a uh, collective to launch um, the Guantanamo Public Memory Project. And uh, the people involved um, initially included people who had been held at Guantanamo, people who had served there, people who had grown up there, um, lawyers who had defended people there, um, as well as people from around the world who were struggling to commemorate their own most kind of contested spaces, uh, including detention sites, um, as uh, places to address the unresolved legacies they still lived with every day. Um, and these were the members of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience um, that I was was running at the time. And we had all together, whether we were in Argentina or South Africa or Europe, um, grappled with the questions this lawyer um, you know, has, not, has just asked um, and questions that our panelists are really going to work through. Um, and so some of these that come up in the papers and that are coming up in, in, in how to answer this question is that when we started um, the Guantanamo Public Memory Project, uh, the, the um, activists in the group um, really resisted the use of the word memory and remember, um, since for them, 
to remember was to suggest that the history was over, the issue was sort of resolved, um, and was sort of placing it in the past. And instead, people who had worked in memory and commemoration in other contexts, such as uh, Memoria Abierta um, uh, in Argentina, introduced the idea of uh, an active memory, um, which emerged from their work uh, remembering the disappeared and the dirty wars, um, and sort of defining remembering as more reminding and also sort of refusing to allow people uh, who needed to be remembered to be disappeared from the public consciousness, um, which was something that was particularly important, obviously, in the case of Guantanamo with people kind of invisible in this remote, um, isolated prison. There was also, so, so these are issues that I think you'll hear today, and there were also um, questions about uh, when to mark the start of the history being remembered, sort of when to remember and for what reason. Um, and I think that's gonna really come out very strongly in, in Professor Koga's study in, in Harbin. Um, so, so one of the things that we hope to do is simply give some historical perspective from an almost sort of after action report style, you know, uh, as the military uses, perspective on this idea of closing Guantanamo. Um, and, you know, in part in very practical terms to remind people and help people understand that it had in fact been closed before, uh, as uh, early as, as only a decade basically before, um, only to be reopened um, uh, to hold, uh, it, it had held uh, tens of thousands of Haitian refugees as well as Cuban refugees um, and been closed several times only to be reopened to sort of um, contain and uh, detain new people um, so that people needed to be very uh, specific and intentional and vigilant about what it is they wanted to close. Um, but we also uh, wanted to, felt it was important to kind of root uh, to, to go back to the roots of the state of exception. I mean, and this required us to go all the way back to 1898 when, uh, and 19, you know, in the years following it when um, in the early 20th century, the lease establishing the state of exception, which literally gave uh, Cuba total sovereignty over the territory, but the U.S. total jurisdiction and control, which created this kind of legal black hole, that, uh, as, as scholars later called it, um, that we needed to go back to, 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 you know, over a century in order to understand how it was possible for us to hold people without trial, um, you know, with a, uh, 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 in, in a military facility there in a land that is in ours. Um, but again, there were many people who felt that going all the way back to the colonial period was kind of distracting um, from what would happen uh, now. Uh, others who had, um, who had um, participated in truth commissions, particularly in post-colonial countries, <coughs> argued that um, they also had, um, in trying to understand recent violence and trauma, felt that it was critical to go back to the original, so the real roots of that in pre-colonial and, um, and colonial uh, encounters and slavery uh, in different contexts. So, but the debate over sort of where to start was, was really uh, uh, critical. So uh, Guantanamo is a place of, um, uh, Oh, and, and also, excuse me, I just also that, that there was a, a conflict over the idea of multiple perspectives, um, that people who had been, uh, even experienced the same thing at the same time at this site had very different interpretations of it, um, such as Cubans who had been um, held there uh, indefinitely um, in the early 1990s, some of whom um, also felt that it was a sort of stepping stone um, to the US and was uh, remembered it as a place uh, of liberty. Uh, so this conflict between sort of memories of imprisonment and, and freedom um, were really uh, intense. So, and, and now that we're looking at um, um, uh, the question of how to sort of remember Khalil Sheikh Mohammed or the places uh, that, that he was associated with him, um, this is a place, uh, a person um, who couldn't be more of a controversial, you know, or sort of contested figure uh, in terms of this idea of victims versus perpetrators. Um, and, you know, when you have victims of the 9-11 Commission observing um, the, his trial um, at the site uh, and sort of understanding who's a victim and who's a perpetrator, which our um, speakers will really um, analyze very well, um, that, you know, it was important to look at the kind of contradictory layers of history um, uh, 
on the site that included both people who were held there and people who remembered it as the place that they were never more free, um, people who grew up on the base um, and had very happy childhoods there, um, really protested the negative associations, the kind of um, corruption or the pollution of their site, uh, of their home place with these kind of associations with terrorism uh, and wanted us to kind of recover the innocence um, of the place. So um, ultimately, we uh, carried, we, we sort of tried to develop the project in a way that would carry out and continue these debates and make them um, as live uh, as possible. So we uh, invited, um, we did it in a kind of collective crowdsourced way where uh, students working with people who had been directly affected um, by the base in one way or the other worked together um, to collectively produce a national um, traveling exhibit and, and web platform. So there were over sort of a thousand people who wound up creating it and um, you know, over a, number, a period of time and carried out these debates. So when the lawyer you know, finally asked um, you know, how to answer this question, she suggested that we say that since someone was tortured there, the place needs to be preserved to kind of remember that abuse forever. Um, but sort of imagining the response of a judge in a military commission, you know, sitting in a hot courtroom in Guantanamo, you know, I'm wondering if it's a sort of another tack might to be to say that it's precisely because of the contestation over whether the place and the people it holds are sort of good or evil or victims or perpetrators, um, and precisely because we're so divided over what happened there and its implications, um, it's precisely because of this politics that it should be commemorated. Um, and that commemoration doesn't need to be sort of fixing a meeting or creating meaning or creating a shrine, but instead creating a space for the past and the present to be in constant dialogue with each other um, as the implications and the legacies of what happened there change um, with each passing day. So the papers um, that you'll hear today, I think, grapple so well um, with uh, these questions and are, are really provide excellent, wonderfully contrasting case studies. Um, one in China, one in Mexico, one's recovering the colonial past, um, the other is sort of more recent violence. Um, but the, the interesting contrast that I heard um, both of them grapple with were sort of between past and present, how to remember something that is ongoing, um, that is uh, very much not past. Um, and this is even relevant when you're looking at you know, something that's over a century ago, um, and how to sort of reconcile different layers of the past, and sort of when is the moment of marking the beginning of the history. Um, and then between victim and perpetrator as well, um, and the sort of distinct conflict between what, who's grievable and ungrievable that you'll hear in the Mexican case, um, and you know, how that relates to place as well as people. Um, so I, I think what's interesting about these is they contest the binary between these uh, you know, past and present victim and perpetrators, but also reveal how difficult it is to sort of to break the binary or to creating kind of meaningful, um, meaningful uh, blending of them. So uh, we'll hear first, I'm told from Yukiko Koga um, from Hunter College uh, on uh, colonial nostalgia in Harbin, followed by um, uh, Professor Alonso and um, Nin, uh, Benjamin Ninas, um, here, uh, Alonso, Alexander Alonso is here from the New School, um, and um, Benjamin Ninas just came in on a red eye, he's amazingly awake, um, from Cal State San Marcos, um, talking about grievability and resistance in Mexico. So I'll invite Yukiko to start, um, who doesn't have slides, so we'll just have the girl. Oh, oh okay, great. Okay, um, I don't have a fancy slide. I just have a fancy name up there. <laughs> and the title of my paper is Inheritance and Betrayal, Historical Preservation and Colonial Nostalgia in Harping. And this chapter um, is from a, a book I just published uh, entitled Inheritance of Loss. And it's really about inheriting wounded places and what it means to inherit something that's so scarred as a lived space and you have to face that no matter what. And the uh, chapter um, 
I, I was at first surprised that I was located in a panel called um, Commemorating, um, what was the panel title? Politics, Politics. Politics of <laughs> Commemoration, because the, um, my my case is really about the politics of uncommemoration. What happens when the state refuses to commemorate the, the injury? What happens when the loss is erased from the landscape, when the, the, the scars of the colonialism, scars of the imperial violence, scars of the war are right there, yet the state refuse to mark it. So it is a story of uncommemoration that I would like to share with you. And the place that takes place is Northeast China. Um, it, it's the, um, near the Russian border. And the name of the city is called Harbin, which um, many people debate it's part Russian, it's part Manchurian. You never know, but uh, it has a lot of Russian influence because the city started as a city in late 19th century when the Russians came and claimed the city and started building a lot of beautiful European buildings, mostly Art Nouveau style, the flamboyant cities. So, you know, when you think about Chinese cities, you might think about the concrete steel, you know, kind of you know, boring, unorganic cities, but when you step out of the Harping Station, you're surrounded by this just incredibly ornate um, late 19th style to t early 20th century style European buildings, which were mostly built by the Russians and also by the Japanese who took over the city after the basically the Russo-Japanese war in 1905. And um, so, so it, it's a city landscape that is marked by this strangely beautiful, uh, aesthetically pleasing um, the legacy of imperial forces. And uh, beneath the beautiful facade, there was a serious um, violence going on, including uh, the very infamous Japanese army unit 731, which was based on the outskirts of the city, and that's was the headquarters for developing chemical and biological weapons. And what the, the Japanese did was to round up Chinese or Koreans from the city, use the, the Japanese consulate building in downtown Harbin as the deposition center. And from there, transported all these human bodies to be used in a human experiment. And what they did in this unit 731 was to develop many, many chemical weapons, and like, for example, mustard gas. And uh, even today, you could find uh, the, the leftover weapons lying around on the riverbed. And sometimes kids play with the remaining chemical weapons and get exposed. So you know, the, the scars are there, yet it's sugar-coated by this beautiful landscape. So that's where my story takes place. and. Um, I think this mentioned a number of times, remembering. And when we talk about wounded places, you know, difficult places, difficult past, we often rely on the concept of remembering or concept of memory. And, um, but today, um, I'm not going to the details of my ethnographic moments. You know, I'm an anthropologist and I do uh, ethnography as a method of looking into things. So, you know, really, re you know, the kind of things I write defies summarizing, but since the time is limited, what I want to do is just pull out some of the key conceptual tools that, that I think would be useful for us to discuss the, you know, how do we approach wounded places. And the concept I would like to introduce today is instead of memory, the concept of inheritance. And the uh, inheritance is not a random concept I picked because in recent years, since China's transition to a market-oriented economy, the Harpin municipal government started using the concept of inheritance to reclaim the material remainder of the Harp city's colonial legacy. And I keep using the word colonial because Harpin was part of um, 
what Japanese called the Manchuko. So it was um, basically formally colonized until 1945. So it was a layer of colonialism, Russian and Japanese imperialism, and the uh, actual war that um, just overlap, that's overlapping there. And the, the reason why I use inheritance is that using the term inheritance, uh, the municipal government is capitalizing on these remainders of Russian and Japanese built landscape and highlighting not the wounds or the loss inflicted by the Russians or Japanese, but aesthetic value, how beautiful it is, and how cosmopolitan this amazing Art Nouveau building means. So historical preservation became a major measure through which the, the municipal government claims that these are our inheritance. By just you know, putting down the scary thing, you know, forget the chemical weapons, but we have this beautiful cosmopolitan past that we are so proud of. And when the historical preservation started, they spent so much money just beautifying all these soot-covered buildings from the turn of the 20th century, while the preservation of the site of the Unit 731 on the outskirts of the city was long neglected. So that contrasts the uncommemoration that's taking place, or a very selective way of um, showcasing the past. And what I would like to tell you is what this capitalization of colonial inheritance through historical preservation produced. Because um, the term inheritance um, in Chinese captures the dynamics that I'm going to just elucidate through a small example. So inheritance um, is consist, consists of two Chinese characters. The first character refers to loss. You lose something. And then the second character refers to, to recover, to produce, to reproduce. So the inheritance in English um, highlights some kind of continuity and possession. But in Chinese, inheritance refers to you recover what you lost. So the, the sense of discontinuity is very key to the idea of inheritance. And in the process of this generational transmission, inheritance also um, refers to something new is occurring through this intergenerational transmission. That's the Chinese meaning of inheritance. And, so, and also inheritance is a transgenerational gift that current generation has no choice but to inherit. It's the kind of gift. It's a classic anthropological <laughs> gift that you cannot refuse, right? So the inability to refuse is the nature of wounded places because that's where you live. It's not like you can say, I don't like it, I don't inherit. You have to inherit. So what happens when the inheritance takes place through a certain mediation of state, which selectively highlights cosmopolitan um, past? So preservation of the project um, is, um, is a particular form of economy of inheritance. And uh, it's uh, how losses sustained through colonial modernity are incorporated into the contemporary landscape or contemporary economic relations to produce new value. And what we want to see is what's this new value that's being produced through this transmission. So when the city went around and they really did a good job in renovating all these dilapidated um, colonial era structures. And it's a striking scenery. And I spoke with some Russian tourists and they're like, oh my God, this is like St. Petersburg. It's just not, it, it, and if you're familiar with uh, East European cities, you, know, you immediately have this deja vu feeling because it's just so European. And the locals are so proud of it. 
You know, it's just so sweet how they are like, oh, no, Yukiko, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Isn't that pretty? And I want to show you this and that. And there is this, what, so historical preservation triggered a old harping nostalgia. So old harping refers to this 19 teens and 20s when there was this cosmopolitan culture, forget that, or other crazy things going on under the imperialism, right? So, so, so old harping nostalgia, and there are so many like brochures, coffee table books, postcards, and uh, actually they are going crazy. And no, the old photography exhibition. And it's so lovely, it brings uh, no, revenues because it's a big tourist destination, so capitalization of colonial inheritance does work, right? That's what the state wanted. But there is always an excess when something goes through this economy. First, so what happened? In highlighting the you know, beautiful landscape, people started to notice the absence in this picture. People started talk, noticing or speaking aloud. They knew it, but now they have a place to talk about it. You know, we missed that building that was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. Oh, wasn't that church, Central Russian Orthodox Church in the center of the city, wasn't that lovely? We really, really miss it. And just to make the state feel better, and you know, in the center of the city, there is this old harping photography nostalgia exhibit, and they even created the reproduction of beloved, destroyed, Central Church, you know, as the symbol of the Communist Party's violence onto its own beloved landscape. So instead of highlighting the colonial violence, it highlighted the Communist Party's violence and the loss from the Cultural Revolution. Second, when people talk nostalgically about the cosmopolitan helping, it's a displaced form of criticism of the current Chinese society, which is full of xenophobic comments and uh, Chinese nationalism, not really open to foreign ideas. So by talking about cosmopolitan or the harping, they are really complaining about the kind of inequality that's growing after the transition to market, the kind of nationalistic close-mindedness. So again, it's a loss that they mourn, loss created by the party state. So <laughs> what happens is this irony of the Chinese state trying to just beautify everything, not talk about you know, the war or anything, and instead it exposes all kinds of layers of losses created by the Chinese state. So that's the that kind of unexpected um, product of the um, product of this transmission of inheritance. And that this kind of dynamics is what I'm calling inheritance and betrayal. Because um, betrayal has three forms of meaning. One is the, the treason or um, treason or um, disloyalty. And then another meaning is to the act of revealing, disclosing, or showing, or exhibiting. And the third meaning of betrayal refers to disclosure or revelation of what should be kept secret. And what's happening in Harping, as we have seen, is that since inheritance embodies multiplicity of the past. You know, when you inherit something as a landscape, there are so many layers of historicity that's contained within the landscape, and you don't exactly know what exactly you are inheriting until the act of inheritance actually takes place. So inheritance embodies multiplicity of the past and displaying inheritance through historical preservation, right? Historical preservation is really showcasing the inheritance, what's supposed to be unseen, hidden, 
and in this case, communist parties on violence um, becomes exposed. So it's a betrayal in all three senses that's happening. <coughs> so what the um, case of Harpin illustrates is that the tension brought forth by the play of these three workings of betrayal, right? Um, contained within the architectural um, inheritance. And by exposing through historical restoration what has long been invisible, the capitalization of colonial inheritance becomes burdened by an unex unexpected excess. So it's the layers of losses you know, created, inflicted by the party that disturbs the long-held narratives of the past that the, the Communist Party is trying to control. And the dynamics of inheritance and betrayal therefore defy the Communist Party's attempts to harness the past through the capitalization of, of colonial inheritance. So originally they thought, well, we want money. We want to compete in a global economy. Therefore, no, we, we just don't talk too much about the violence. Let's just you know, play out the tourist game and just you know, highlight the beauty. Well, it didn't work out that way. So, um, so inheritance and betrayal capture the dynamics that um, I'm going to summarize in three points, and then I'll be done. So I think I should be uh, within the time limit. So acts of inheriting reveal and articulate loss. So the wounds or the loss is not self-obvious. It's through the act of inheriting that loss becomes articulated. And uh, so the recovery or redemption or reincorporation of what is being lost becomes only present or only visible through the act of inheriting. And um, only through, so in other words, only through the act of inheriting one actually knows what one inherits because what's there is full of secrets. And inherit, uh, in the process of inheriting colonial modernities, material remainders, in the case of Harpin, the, the built environment, um, the original loss sustained through colonial modernity by the Russians and the Japanese is assigned new meaning. It's the cosmopolitan imperialism, while losses from different time period, the Cultural Revolution era, um, in the case of Harpin, or the losses incurred through the transition to market economy become part of what one inherits. And what's being transmitted, it turns out, are not only the original loss from the colonial era, but also losses from the Mao era and the reform era, which you know, are compounded by a keen sense of loss felt by the many ordinary residents in Harbin who feel the, the squeeze as the consequences of the transition to market economy. So dynamics of inheritance and betrayal, as I'm calling it, really extends the temporal scope of one's inherited loss. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be part of this excellent program. And although I was also surprised, I'm really delighted to share this panel with um, our colleague and friend Yukiko. Um, so the starting point for our project is a busy intersection between Reforma Avenue and the Periférico Freeway in the Polanco neighborhood in Mexico City, which is one of the most affluent areas. And next to the Campo Marte military camp, is where rows of large steel rusted walls adorn what was previously an unused section of the Bosque de Chapultepec, which is the largest park in the city. While millions of drivers and pedestrians pass through the area every day as part of their commute, very few are aware that this space now marks the state-sanctioned memorial for the victims of violence, 
built in 2011 to commemorate the victims of violence of a so-called drug war begun in 2006. Initiated by the Felipe Calderon administration and continued during the current government of Enrique Peña Nieto, the strategy to confront the drug cartels with an enlarged military presence has claimed more than 100,000 lives and led to the disappearance of more than 27,000. The rush to build a memorial to commemorate an event that has not concluded was a response from the government to the growing mobilization of Mexican civil society groups demanding justice for the victims, including their identification, decriminalization, and a space for collective public mourning and recognition. These massive steel plates do not include any names. The only permanent inscriptions on a few of them are the name of the memorial, Memorial to the Victims of Violence, and quotes by renowned authors that, that evoke questions about death, memory, and mourning. Visitors can request a piece of chalk from the security guards that are ever present as one walks along the space and use the chalk to express their reactions directly on the steel plates. Traces of a variety of drawings and phrases are present as one walks through the memorial on some of the steel walls, but the rain washes them away over time. There are also traces of graffiti, but some of it has been erased by the government agency that manages the memorial because they consider that the messages are offensive or counter the purpose of the memorial. The memorial remains largely unused and unrecognized by the sectors of civil society that regionally demanded that such a space was necessary. One of the, most, uh, one of the largest groups was the Movement for Peace with Justice and Dignity, led by Javier Sicilia, a poet whose son was killed by members of a drug gang in Cuernavaca in 2011. He had put this at the center of its demands for justice and dignification of the hundreds of thousands of victims of the drug war who are often portrayed by the government and the media as collateral damage, as criminals who killed each other or deserved what happened to them. The memorial was intended as a space for mourning, a space where communities could come together, and a space that could represent and mobilize society around the ongoing violence and its many victims. Contrary to Cecilia's group's hope to develop a project led by the victims and the families of the victims, the administration's urgency to complete the project before Calderon left office in 2012 and control the outcomes of the project led to a very controversial process that included a very rushed architectural contest, which most architects boycotted due to concerns about it, a problematic choice of location next to a military camp when military officials have precisely been accused of being the perpetrators or accomplices for the violence of the drug cartels, and far removed from the communities most affected by the violence. Referred to by many as a memorial of the state, a bogus gesture, or simply as a pretty park by critics of the project, the memorial has become a reference point for a movement towards a different kind of memorial project in a country where questions of memory and public space had not been at the center of public debates until now. In recent years, civil society groups and activists have challenged such structures, both by intervening directly in state-sanctioned spaces, such as the memorial that you see here, repurposing and redefining existing spaces, as well as creating alternative memorials with a focus on the communities affected by different forms of violence. Through these practices, they assign responsibility, as well as broaden the claims about the grievability of victims. Um, the victim's access to justice in the no, that's not working. Sorry, um, the victim's access to justice in the context of violence in Mexico has been increasingly framed through a larger framework of transitional justice. Initially, using the transitional justice frame to address the violence is counterintuitive in at least two ways. First, transitional justice measures seem to enter the picture in moments of a regime change. Secondly, and closely related, the violence that is addressed in transitional justice measures is considered to have terminated. Neither of the two conditions, of course, are met in the Mexican context. Nevertheless, uh, we see um, increasingly evocations of the transitional justice paradigm, most recently uh, by one member of the interdisciplinary group of independent experts uh, in the wake of the disappearance of the 43 students in Ayotzinapa. Uh, quote, many of the victims' demands, even, even for the tools developed based on international experience for addressing those problems, are similar to transitional justice demands regardless of the existence of a situation of political transition, end quote. Moreover, as Carl and others have shown, in the context of forced disappearances in the Mexican dirty war in the 1960s and 70s, transitional justice is best understood as a political ritual, 
quote, a rite of passage in the liminal phase, end quote, between two opposed realities. A separation from the old status, a society in war and violence, and the phase of integration that is a desired new status of a society with justice and peace. Using the framework of transitional justice, therefore, also allows actors to bring in larger questions about the regime and the necessity for structural change. And this framework has found its way into the Mexican debates on the, uh, on the proper societal responses to narco violence and the war on drugs, in part by symbolically linking current, uh, current violence to the unaddressed disappearances of Mexico's dirty war. With regard to the specific questions of creating sites of memory, uh, like the one behind me, a transitional justice discourse and toolkit also taps into very specific understandings of the role and function of comm commemorative efforts. Memorialization has been acknowledged as an important tool in the context of transitioning regimes and or mass scale human rights violations and is often seen as a symbolic form of reparations for the victims. Um, as the uh, International Center for Transitional Justice calls it, a public acknowledgement and recognition of private suffering. However, in explicitly uh, transitional settings, memorials are also expected to be future-oriented. In an imagined ideal type, the cathartic, victim-focused, and mourning-related functions of sites of memory are to be carefully balanced with the didactic and social functions. The composition of memorials addressing large-scale violence thus needs to respond to the question of how to provide quasi-sacred spaces of grief with more profane elements of public spaces. In terms of those larger societal benefits, the political aspect of memorials has been increasingly foregrounded. Again, the International Center for Transitional Justice, in a claim in a 2007 report, quote, memorials are too often understood, understood as outside the political process, relegated to the soft cultural sphere as art objects, to the private sphere of personal mourning, or to the margins of power and politics, end quote. Instead, we now see an increased focus on the memorial as a space of open dialogue and even conflict, agonism, a training ground for a more participatory or even agonistic system to come, a point of departure for debate rather than a sacred space of mourning. In that regard, the transitional justice paradigm on memorialization has drawn heavily from a general skepticism of monumental sites of memory, most notably reflected in the theoretical literature by notions of the counter monument in James Young way back in the 90s, or more recently by Christiane Wilke as a complex memorial. Accordingly, and here I quote uh, uh, Yellen, another scholar of memorials in Latin America, quote, meaning is never crystallized, carved out, or inscribed in the stone of a monument or in the engraving of a plaque. The markers are not memory itself, but vehicles and material supports for the subjective labors of memory for collective action, end quote. Memorials in transitioning uh, and ideally transformative settings are supposed to perform plurality and commitment to deliberation by incorpor incorporating in the design of, uh, of territorial markers a level of ambiguity that invites active engagement of the public, offering an opportunity for expression of a variety of sensibilities. There is, of course, a tension between this, uh, form what Young called formalization of impermanence, and the need for symbolization, recognition, and clearly assigned responsibility. While the ambiguity and openness of reflexive monuments is often evoked to stress the communal effort to shape meaning in a pluralistic setting, uh, to see official memory as the accumulation of vernacular memories, or uh, the society's continuous everyday responsibility to remember, um, other potential functions of public memorials can suffer in its wake, such as establishing an undeniable acknowledgement of specific victims or clear facts about the human rights violations. Even if the Mexican state hardly has an obvious interest in taking the transitional justice framework to its full conclusion, for obvious reasons, framing the violence as part of systematic state violations is one of the claims the memorial hopes to avoid by all, at all costs, it nevertheless performed adherence to the open concept of memorials derived from transitional justice and counter-monumental arguments in its de design choice for the memorial of the victims of violence. To quote the architects, Society is in charge of making the memorial, end quote. However, the space of civic engagement has been created with specific limits in mind. Not least, as uh, Alejandra mentioned, in the choice of location. Moreover, in this case, the ambiguity of the memorial rests on and even depends on the ambiguity of the violence itself. 
Rosanna Reguillo's uh, account of the violence serves as a powerful starting point to think through some of these challenges of a Mexican memorial for the victims of violence more thoroughly. In particular, she raises questions about our tendency to speak of just one violence in the Mexican context. Alternatively, she proposes to demarcate at least four types of violence. Structural violences that victimize surplus bodies unusable by the system, historic violence based on long-lasting claims of inferiority of certain groups, disciplining violence, a form of violence that forces into submission by its exempl exemplary status, and diffuse violence, quote, <coughs> whose origin is impossible to attribute to anything other than the phantasmagoric entities, narcos, terrorism, and which is almost impossible to prevent because it does not follow an intelligible pattern, end quote. She describes the violence as a, of the narco machine as a form of domination that, quote, derives from occupying a delocalized space that is impossible to symbolize, end quote. All four forms of violence face uh, similarly desperate gestures of intelligib intelligibility that often leave us with the, um, quote, collapse of our interpretive systems which end up producing the demented dichotomy of the good dad and the bad dad, end quote. Cory Boudreau uh, recently um, has described some of these attempts to make the violence intelligible and provide spaces in which the grievability of victims can be asserted, um, and she did that in the context of uh, Juarez. In particular, she depicts the framing according to which violent death in the current context becomes its own justification. The, quote, the dead deserve to die, and we know this because they are dead, end quote. The status of the criminalized, ungrievable life finds no recognition in these frames. The memorial for the victims of violence has provided its own frames of intelligibility, however. At first sight, um, Gaeta, who is the architect's abstract design, reminds many visitors um, of the influence that he actually had of Eisenmann's uh, memorial for the murdered Jews of Europe, uh, and also other recent uh, non-representational uh, uh, memorials. Uh, actually, Gaeta's own genealogy, and we know this from interviews, uh, with uh, one in longer interview with him, uh, points in a very similar direction, that Eisenmann was a huge, um, huge influence. In many ways, the critique of Eisenmann's Berlin design could be easily rehashed here. A lack of establishing historical relations to a specific event risks becoming, and here I quote one of the most famous critics, Pickford, it risks becoming aesthetically autonomous or self-referential or merely formal, or the antithesis of bearing any historical relation, myth, end quote. And Eisenmann, of course, famously uh, uh, claimed that he wanted a space without information. And there's indeed very little information uh, in this memorial as well. In its more straightforward symbolism, however, the memorial does make specific historical claims, specifically by locating violence entirely on the site of organized crime. The choice of placing the memorial in a military park is, to many, a clear statement that the administration actively ignored the role of the military and the state in the violence more broadly. With regard to questions of access, the memorial's placement in one of the most affluent neighborhoods of Mexico City um, uh, avoids a direct confrontation with those most vulnerable to the narco machine. Although its failure in this regard is also its success because we could say uh, the avoidance of this confrontation is an inherent admission of the role of class in the conflict. Some of its most widely criticized features, for example, the choice um, not to include names, are actually justified by the designers in references to an open memorial concept. Names were left out so as not to, uh, quote, exclude anyone, and so that, quote, victims aren't next to perpetrators so that we know it's ongoing, end quote. And this is Gaeta once again. Visitors are encouraged to engage and shape the memorial according to the original concept of an open project, open to the city and open to the appropriation of the citizens, end quote. In particular, those entering the grounds can ask, as Alejandro mentioned, for chalk to express their own reactions or messages to the steel slabs. Oh, wow. Exactly where the boundaries around this state-sponsored iconoclasm are drawn remains unclear, even in interviews with officials or with the architect. Ironically, by inviting graffiti, the city placed with a mode of expression that, um, sorry, the site placed with a mode of expression that in other commemorative spaces in Mexico has been linked to the delinquency of the victims and therefore often been deciphered as a posthumous confirmation of the criminality of the victim. <laughs> 
Many activists found that engagement with an Ill illegitimate memorial would give too much ground to the state-sponsored view of violence, especially when the form of that engagement was actively sanctioned and even encouraged. The response of those hoping to create alternative spaces to symbolize or reflect on the violence largely falls into two camps, those who take the invitation to reappropriation seriously and those who take the memorial sites elsewhere. And Ali is talking about those. So first, I'm going to talk about one of the groups that has uh, intervened in the memorial to reclaim this space and reappropriate it. Uh, this is a group called Comité 68, which is uh, an organization founded by a group of activists, intellectuals, and artists to commemorate the victims of the 1968 and 1971 student massacres in Mexico City, as well as the dirty war of the 1970s. Their main goal is to bring the perpetrators to justice and ensure that these events are not forgotten, so they have created their own archive about the victims of state violence collected through oral histories and primary documents, and they've brought legal cases against the Mexican officials that are considered the perpetrators of those events. So building on that work, uh, which mainly consists of marches, publications, and a steel dedicated to the victims of the 1968 massacre in the plaza where it occurred, members of Comité 68 decided to intervene in the space of the memorial um, of the victims of violence to reclaim and eventually transform it. Their main goals were to challenge the state's narrative by drawing a link between the drug war and the state violence dating back to the 1950s, assigning direct responsibility to the state and naming the victims. In a response to a memorial to victims without victims, on each of the steel plates in the memorial, they placed canvases with the names of se more than 7,000 victims of various events of state violence, including political persecution, torture, extrajudicial killings, forced disappearance, feminicides, and criminal negligence. The events listed go back to the 1950s and also include more recent events that occurred after the inauguration of the memorial, such as the disappearance of the 43, 43 students from an Ayotzinapa. And in their most recent intervention in the memorial a couple of uh, months ago, they included a new title for the memorial, which is Memorial to the Victims of State Violence, um, with these big banners that are sort of st stickers that go on top of the steel walls. Um, most of the civil society groups involved in activism around justice and memory have rejected the space and refused any involvement in it, despite Comité's um, call for them to join this movement. But their idea was uh, that this would be an opportunity to give the space a new meaning and repurpose it in order to assign this state responsibility. And for them, this is a way to reclaim the memorial, to move it beyond being an institutional or state-sanctioned memorial into a seized <coughs> memorial, where memory is built through our own archives, we name our victims, and we assign responsibility. And part of their goal is also to bring together different groups and social movements that have been working on these similar efforts separately for a very long time in Mexico. Um, as one of the activists says, we want to make the memorial our own. We see it as a call for justice to not forget who are the perpetrators of violence and the crimes. The next one, I'm gonna go quickly because we're out of time, is the News Divine. Um, this is a, a space um, that at first sight does not fit into the narrative of the landscape of memorials of narco violence. It was a club, a uh, discotheque. Um, and although the event it commemorates occurred in 2008 in the context of the drug war as part of the strategy from the city government, they the city government decided to demonstrate a different way of dealing with organized crime as opposed to the direct confrontations and violence seen in other parts of the country. So the News Divine Memorial commemorates the deaths of 12 youth and two police officers as a result of a failed police raid inside a discotheque in a low-income area of Mexico City. Police brutality and negligence of the government authorities at various levels was blamed for the fact that this ill-conceived police operation resulted in death by suffocation when the police closed the doors of the establishment to prevent the youth from leaving the pre premises. So the architect, uh, a young man named Sergio Beltran, decided to uh, lead this project in a way that was uh, running counter to uh, the experience of the Central Memorial in, in Mexico City, which he did submit a proposal for as well, making a distinction between um, monuments and memorials. This is the architect. 
this is his, his slide, uh, sort of drawing this distinction, um, and a focus on not just having a building, but having uh, an institute, a city council, a documentary, a cultural program, and public space. So he insisted that memorials need to serve as tools rather than symbols, and that architects' um, interventions should have a focus on urban renewal and not just on, on the monument itself. The last example I'm going to give you is uh, a project in Tijuana uh, called RECO, uh, which has a similar focus on urban renewal and community involvement. This is a plot uh, called Maclovio Rojas, which is located out in the outskirts of the city in an area that's very difficult and even dangerous to access given the continuing presence of organized crime. This is a plot where, one of, where the drug cartels brought dead bodies with the purpose of eliminating any trace of their existence. A man nicknamed El Pozolero, uh, which means pozole is a, is a stew, uh, a Mexican stew, he would dissolve the bodies in acid and deposit their remains in a pit on the ground, making it nearly impossible to find any remains that could be identified through DNA. The plot was disguised as an auto repair shop, but when El Pozolero was captured, part of his statements, in part of his statements, he gave the location of this uh, place, and the association of the families of the victims of Baja California used the information to find uh, the plot after months of searching for it because they didn't trust that the authorities would find them on their own. So with their own picks and shovels, they started breaking the concrete blocks that covered the pits where the remains were in. Um, and once they saw what was inside, they called the police. Forensic examiners came, and they concluded that no identification was possible given the state in which the remains were in. So even though no DNA matches were obtained, many families of the victims felt that a strong connection to this site. Some of them had a sense that this is where their loved one's resting place was, and they came together to hold a mass in memory of the victims and decided that they wanted to do something else with the space. Um, they wanted to dignify the space in a similar way to the News Divine Memorial and Comité to name the victims and to decriminalize them. Um, as a result of their work, the government granted them uh, the, the permission to use the land and they got a grant from a university to begin work in the space. They covered the, the pits with mosaic, um, they created murals, sorry I'm, I'm forgetting this, um, this is what the space looks like. Um, they created murals and um, they, the project is this idea of RECO means reconciliation, remembrance and reconstruction. Um, However, the funding promised by the government to build a bigger space and a full memorial never came, and the space currently remains mostly abandoned, full of trash. And the final point I want to make, um, the co-leader of the project has explained to us in various interviews that they've settled into building this space more as a community center rather than a whole memorial because it is extremely difficult to work in this space, both because the local community is pushing to forget, to, to get people out of the space and avoid having a reminder of what happened there because they're also blamed for being accomplices to what happened there and that stigmatizes their community, but also because every time there is an action in this space, an, an artistic event or a documentary showing, uh, criminal organizations uh, pose their, their threats to, to the community that is working there. So in the end, this brings together a question of how to commemorate and dignify the victims of ongoing forms of violence in which the state itself is still participating. Thank you. So I know we're short of uh, time, so I'm gonna, I do have a, a question for the group, but I'd actually like to instead turn it over um, to make sure that all of you have a chance to, to ask. Yes, in the back. Did you, was that a, a hand? Oh. oh. <laughs> I would just like to say that uh, uh, the one that the, the, the two just showed with the, those big rectangular things, um, at first I thought they looked very forbidding. No, not the, you know, the previous one, but I, you know, a few, a few ago, uh, you know, uh, those big metal things, that, that. At first, in the first picture, I thought it was very, very forbidding like they were trying to design a place that nobody would ever want to go and look at. But then after a while, I thought it was like the spirits of the people who had died, so like righteous indignation. I sort of found some, even before you put the names on it, I found a way to look at it. I think it helps when I saw the one where the reflecting 
that made it seem a little more humanized somehow. But that picture, I feel like those huge structures mm -hmm. are like yeah. the souls of the people who are being commemorated yeah. and that they're tributes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the debate that the activists uh, and architects that oppose this project uh, want to pose is that we shouldn't even discuss the aesthetic um, <laughs> um, um, elements of the project and whether it's valuable as a project itself. It has won an incredible number of awards internationally, and the architect is the first thing he will tell you when he comes, because it's, in, it's highly contested in Mexico. People have not even uh, agreed to publish anything about it in any of the large, uh, the important architectural magazines. Um, so they they deny even you know the, the opportunity to legitimize this project by talking about it from an architectural perspective because it's so um, it came from an illegitimate space because it did not include the victims and all these other problems. That but at this point, they were not. I feel mm -hmm. that in despite their intention to make some place that nobody would go to and that people would be forgotten, despite that, I find something moving about it, which I don't really think is aesthetic. Although the word aesthetic involves feeling, so maybe it's related. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, thank you. I do have a question for everybody, but I'm just going it, to, are you sure you don't have anything you want to ask? Because once I get going, then they're not going to stop. <laughs> well, you feel free to interrupt now, because it's not for us, this is for you, not for us. Um, but one of the things that I really appreciated about both of um, the papers today and that um, in the work, uh, both on the ground and um, theoretically in the field that I've encountered um, is not always uh, sufficiently, I think, analyzed is the tensions and the real complications between state and uh, civil society in uh, and the sort of power relationships and the institutional relationships and how those shape the possibilities um, for commemoration. Um, so, you know, the state plays such different uh, roles in each of these examples, um, but I think it's sort of not as simple as, um, it's a very complicated uh, relationship. We talked a little bit about it at lunch, but I wondered if, um, if you all could sort of comment on um, you know, what, what you were trying to understand in your own cases, but also what you hope those uh, people who, are, you know, those of us who are trying to understand it more generally in different contexts would, you know, how we would learn from your analysis and also people who are working on it on the ground, what you think is important um, to take away um, from the tensions you observed. Yeah, I, just one thing I think um, that I that we both find interesting, and, and this is what we try to address, is that of course um, um, l linking state-sponsored large public memorials to to um, uh, an idea of the counter monument that originally came out of a specific context, uh, specifically in Germany and uh, uh, Holocaust memorials, and specifically from non-state funded memorials that had something transgressive about them uh, or al something alternative about them. Um, I think what fascinated us is how, how much in this particular case uh, the state tried to incorporate some of that language. And so Alejandro mentioned that uh, it seems when we talk to architects and, and uh, activists that, um, that Mexico is coming somewhat late to the memorial debate in general, specifically compared to its southern neighbors. And, um, and there seems to be a, quite an effort on the side of the state, um, knowing how, it, how, how illeg illegitimate some of these sites were at least perceived by most people to, to include some, um, some of this language. Um, but then of course, for some of the activists, it seemed uh, quite um, counterintuitive to engage in a space that has some sort of state-sponsored transgression, uh, if that's even possible. <laughs> um, and so I think that's, that is what fascinates us. What, what does it mean if, if you're given um, the, um, the permission uh, to, uh, to engage in iconoclasm, really, <laughs> and to, uh, it, 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 it makes for very, very uh, weird moments. When Alejandro and I went, uh, we were given chalk, basically, by this state agent, and, and he was standing there, and another, uh, officer um, uh, explained Hegel to me with chalk on one of the uh, uh, one of the steel uh, things. He ex explained to me thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and um, 
uh, was was right on the memorial, and and so I it, so so many things were going on in my head. Uh, none of them had anything to do with Hegel, quite frankly. And I, I um, it, so it it really raises these issues of of sacredness and profanity, but but also most importantly, this idea, and it came up earlier, um, this idea of creating these spaces that that have a sense of agonism to it and, and transgression. But uh, it seems extremely weird when when they're so heavily incorporated. Uh, into something that's supposed to legitimize um, a project that is, in a sense, performing a, a radical openness, but in all of its choices was anything but. So I think that's, I think, uh, what what uh, I find particularly interesting. I could say much more about these alternative um, memorials because they can't do without the state either, right? So this is not completely outside of this realm. But they deal also, we need to also understand the state is not monolithic here, right? right. So sometimes it's the city, as, right. in, as in the News Divine element, sometimes it's the federal government. The city had a very different approach to dealing with violence and, and with delinquency. So it's a rather complex story. But uh, I think, yeah, that's my first attempt. <laughs> Maybe having heard, I mean, we, we you know, the state plays such a different role in your context, and maybe not only speaking about yours, but maybe how, if there's any sort of um, larger lesson to be drawn from bringing these two together in your view. So, um, in the case of China, this state civil society line is not really easy to draw, and uh, the real wounds that matters to the contemporary Chinese in Harping is really the wounds from the Cultural Revolution. That's a major wounds that the inability to mourn the wounds, not because it was not because it was so traumatic, but because everybody was um, implicated. And you know, when the victims and perpetrator line is clear you can mourn, and in the case of the Japanese war violence against the Chinese, you know, it's very easy to blame the Japanese, and then, okay, here is the narrative. But in the case of the so-called, I kept saying, you know, party state violence, it, it, it's not party state, it's everybody's violence against everybody. And you know, it's very difficult to tell who was really the victim who was the perpetrator. And, you know, and now there are colleagues sitting right next to one another. And you know, everybody knows what the other one did during the Cultural Revolution, but they cannot talk about it. And it's fascinating when I ask them about the Japanese violence, you know, they give me a kind of party narrative type thing, but then they'll say, but, <laughs> You know, I was in love with that Japanese girl next door. So, so the location of every day is very different when they talk about that, that you know, colonial violence. They cannot talk in a concrete form when people, when I start pushing them to tell me about cultural revolution, they can only speak in the very general pronouns, never specifying, because that would evoke a lot of ghosts they are not ready to deal with. And uh, so the, the role of the state, role of civil society, is a very complicated thing. And, and Ben mentioned, well, state has many layers. Again, state has many layers in China, too, because that the big state, that Beijing state, plays a different role than the municipal government. Mm -hmm. And the municipality wants to make money. I and mean, in Beijing too, but at, at, at a very different level. So for them, tourism, and this is the China's rust belt. You know, they lay off the so many heavy industry, um, state-run unit, employ people. So you know, they desperately need a new economic boost for survival and tourism. That's all they got. That's how they feel. So, you know, for them, forget that the, the big state narrative of anti-imperialism. No, we, we just need to survive in this globalized economy and let's 
just capitalize on whatever we have, which is this beautiful thing, and why not make money off of it, right? So, um, and the, so it, there is a gap between what the Beijing directive says, and I didn't have the chance to go into it, but there was a um, historian's debate among local historians about what to deal with the fact that the city originates in imperial expansion. You know, are we a colonial city, or is it, a, is it not patriotic to call themselves a colonial city? You know, did we have origin before being colonized? Well, it was a fishing village. Was it a city? Well, no, it wasn't a city. But what is our origin? You know, is it OK to just you know, celebrate the centenary of the city? But that was the Russians who came to start our, our city. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's like celebrating Columbus Day. You know, they actually used that example. So you know, it, it's this complicated thing going on when you, know, you start talking about uh, the role of a state. You know, where do we sit? So. <laughs> In both talks, I was struck by the fact that uh, objects don't speak for themselves. You know, the, the, you know, the way in which um, uh, the objects appear within a social world of agreement and contestation, and uh, they um, take on a meaning, no matter what the intention, uh, because of the, the social world that surrounds them. And uh, I, you know, this, so that means we want to know more about the social world that surrounds them, even as we pay attention to the objects. And I think that that probably has something to say about uh, the need for uh, designers and architects to actually work with people who are paying very close attention to the texture of the social world. Now, I'll confess I'm a sociologist. <laughs> but, but, but still, it, it's striking to me. And the other thing that I find really interesting is the, um, you know, the, 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 there's been a revolution in memorialization. You know, it, it used to be that it, it, uh, you memorialized uh, uh, following a heroic narrative. And uh, it strikes me that states are always ambivalent about uh, trans moving away from the, the heroic nar narrative. So at the same time that there's this awareness that there's trauma and we want to confront trauma, uh, uh, there is, uh, or, or suffering, and we want to con uh, 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 confront suffering uh, um, and, it, and its complexity and its tragedies, there's still a desire to be lyrical. <laughs> and. and uh, and it seems to me that the, in both cases, the, the unanticipated critical meaning of a commercial project, you know, let's simplify, uh, 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 has to do with that. And, and, uh, uh, and the kind of failure of uh, uh, a brilliant movement of uh, uh, memorial design uh, um, as well has something to do. You know, one thing that occurred to me, building on what Jeff's comments, it strikes me that the lyrical and elegiac has more to do with the deceit, and what's always missing is um, the tribe, the icon, the perpetrator. So how reconciling that, you know, I, I agree this is more complicated because the state is, in the, in the architecture should perhaps not work for a corrupt client. <laughs> That's really the issue. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, I think the issue is he, he, you, know, you hire an architect and you give them a commission and they know they're implicated in a phony story. That's another kind of corruption. But I, I still think that one of the problems is you, whatever kind of memorial you 
inside the World Trade Center in a couple weeks right after it, is um, these things are still alive, and there's a desire to shut the conversation off. So the question to the court is, the incident, the crime is still underway. So there's a desire to, to codify it very quickly. This was a huge debate in the World Trade Center at multiple levels. Uh, I think the Vietnam Memorial uh, uh, is the signifier for names on everything. After that point, everybody started bolting names on, which is very strange. Um, and uh, that phenomena to, because we don't know how to answer it, we don't want to deal with the pain, and we don't want to have an open conversation. It seems, and so that's what this, this is stuck in, and I think this is why people want to preserve it for the same as this man's enough. The second one that I've seen, having gone to many global conferences, is this notion of the smart, resilient city, is that we can overcome pain really quickly. Um, you know, there's this big debate, it's like, let, let's, there's the new resilient cities, and they're really scary places, but they have <coughs> memorials that have say, well, we resolve that, but, you know, the genocide thing's over, okay. Um, and so we're, we're getting on with it. And so that means it's all right to do business with people We'll be exposed to that question. We resolve that. It, it's fine to do business in Mexico City because we've kind of resolved that question. And I think it's been pulled up there. This tradition of public art and memorial building coming out of the 80s and 90s, out of all kinds of things, has morphed up into big business of the symbols of it's all right to do business in the world of conflict. Um, and it's, it, it's problematic. It's very, really, very problematic. This This project is like. Paragon, Petrogal Colonnade, this is uh, Robert Irwin uh, slabs, and um, the chalk on the wall came out of southern cities in the 90s when people weren't getting public access, so they said, how do we get political comment? Well, we'll, mm -hmm. put, we'll put big walls outside and people can write comments. Okay. We're getting screwed by government. Hey, it's liberty. And so, so that, you know, that was why the South was being redistricted. But so there, we kind of walked into that, that conversation. So I think there's more, the word, I like your point of how do we accept our inheritance rather than dealing with preservation? I think that's the key. Accepting inheritance isn't necessarily an easy thing, right? It's I think that early back said the Berlin Wall came down and we said, ah, oh, our German relatives, and the wall came down and they were, who the hell are these people, right? We have to accept that. So I think we get in, if we get into multi-generational sustainability, whatever, we have to learn how to accept inheritance, which is not a truth that's hard to handle. <coughs> but we can't just sit there and not know we weren't all involved. I think this is the vote in Colombia and Medellin and all of that. We thought Medellin, Bogota, we had all these great public spaces, and then they had a vote like, well, yeah. Maybe we were all involved. So I think your 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 language is really important to answer the question. Uh, we haven't accepted the inheritance of rendition. <laughs> and it's, as Clyde was talking about, it's an axiom of our life. Actually, it's not. A, it's not just an incident. This is actually a common element in our life, which is the thing we're really reconciling with. Are we going to do memorial to Ferguson? Are we going to do memorial to, to Baltimore? I think that's called civil rights. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's very, I think it's a very fertile question now because I think it's, most of these things are being used this kind of means to sort of calm the, the real estate world. Well, I'm, and this is my time that I was given to wrap it up, so I'm going to do just that. Um, thank you. That was a nice <coughs> compliment and summary to everybody. Um, so thank you so much. I don't know what's happening now, but I have uh, a real <laughs> privilege to be at the same table with these folks, and uh, thanks for your comments.